Good evening and welcome to Writers Unplugged. This is a series that will air throughout the year in support of Cleveland Reads. Writers Unplugged is a chance to hear your favorite writers or new to you writers in conversation as if you were eavesdropping on them in a coffee shop. Cleveland Reads is an initiative to improve the literacy levels in our community and Mayor Bibb has challenged Clevelanders to collectively read 1 million books and or 10 million minutes. And I can tell you as of this weekend, they surpassed both goals. So way to go, Clevelanders. My name is Jen Jumba. I'm a librarian here at the main branch of Cleveland Public Library. One of my favorite things besides reading is talking to writers. It's an opportunity to get to know their craft, what inspires their stories, where they like to write, essentially getting to know them and see them as human beings and not just the name on the spine of a book. And this evening, we are so lucky to have Lee Matthew Goldberg with us. Before I get started, I wanna mention a couple of housekeeping notes. To find out who else is visiting Writers Unplugged, both virtually and in person, visit clevelandreads.com backslash unplugged. And then Max Beck's Books on Coventry, which is our wonderful independent bookstore, is here and has copies of Lee's books just waiting for you. So brief introduction. Lee Matthew Goldberg is the author and screenwriter of 13 novels, including The Ancestor, Slow Down, The Mentor from St. Martin's Press, Stalker Stalked, Orange City, and the five book Desire Card series. And then the young adult trilogy, Runaway Train. He is currently in um, attached to develop this series with Reagan Rayvord from TV's Young Sheldon. So huge kudos on that. Lee has been published in multiple languages, a finalist for the Anthony Award, and nominated for the Prix du Polar. After graduating with an MFA from the New School, his writing has appeared as a contributor. And this is just to name a few because we want to be able to have a conversation. Otherwise, I just read all his accolades. Crime Reads, Pipeline Artist Lit Hub, the Los Angeles Review of Books. His pilots and screenplays have been finalists, and this is, again, just to name a few, Script Pipeline, A Book Pipeline, Stage 32, We Screenplay, and The New York Screenplay, Screencraft, and The Hollywood Screenplay Contest. And I think that's why you'll find his writing perfectly captures scenes that you can almost see playing on a movie screen in your head. And Lee is also the founder, which we'll touch on in a little bit, of the Gorilla Lit Reading Series. So join me in a warm welcome to Lee Matthew Goldberg. Hi, Jen. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, thank you for joining us. So um, congratulations. This is The Great Gimmelmans. Awesome. It is just about a month old. So even less, like two even weeks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is kind of like when you have like a new baby, it, it's measured in days and then weeks. And mm -hmm. when we get to like my age, we just start mm -hmm. <laughs> rounding yeah. down. So um, can you give us a little bit of an overview of this book? Sure. Um, the Great Gimmelmans, it's set in the, whoops, there we go, um, in the 1980s. And it's about a mild mannered Jewish family of bank robbers. They lose all their money in the stock market. And the only thing that's not repossessed is the family's guest guzzling RV and they take off with it and decide to rob banks and become the most notorious bank robbers of their era um, until the wheels kind of start falling off the, yeah, the RV. No pun bit. intended, right? Yeah, no pun intended. <laughs> no pun intended. So I have to just kind of just take a couple seconds to talk about a line in the prologue or a couple lines okay. where you say, writers don't make great parents. We're too devoted to our characters to surrogate children and crime writers, especially. I spend my days conjuring up 50 ways to hide a body and makes it difficult to find sympathy in wiping away tears when a toe gets stubbed. So immediately it sets the tone for this book in terms mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. the sense of humor that is interwoven throughout the entire story. Yeah, I, I really, I mean, I, I mostly write thrillers and some of my mm -hmm. thrillers are a lot more even darker than this one. Yes. Um, this one, I really wanted to ingest as much humor as possible. I mean, it it's sad in parts too, and it breaks your heart. Um, but I really hope that people like butt Gus laugh from this book when they're reading it. Um, and that was really my intention when I was writing. Yeah, well, I, I will say that uh, your intention was fulfilled because there were times awesome. where I was literally laughing out loud and people, you know, kind of reading this here, there and everywhere. And people are kind of looking at me like, really? 
I was like, oh no, you, you, you got to read this because it's, it's laugh out loud funny. And then there are other times where to your point, it broke my heart. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then in the next chapter, it found a way to kind of put it back together again mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i mean that's the best accolade a writer could hear honestly um so that's Aww. very very sweet for you to say um yeah i mean i <laughs> I love reading a book that I'm so invested in that it makes me laugh and cry at the same time. Yes. Um, and you know, the fact that this book can bring joy to some people right now, that's fantastic. Like that's all I could ask for with it. Um, and it was a lot of fun to write this one. This was probably one of my that, most favorite That absolutely books. comes through. Yeah. Um, we were talking a little bit beforehand. Can you talk about when you wrote this? Sure, yeah. So uh, originally the book was supposed to be set in the 1930s and it was going to be a very sad, depressing book about the Great Depression and this family who um, loses all their money in the stock market crash of 29 and then starts robbing banks. And then yeah. COVID happened and, you know, we all know how that went. And in 2020, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't go more depressing than the reality. So I almost had to reverse that. And something about the 80s was just calling to me the, the pop music, uh, the kind of, you know, over the topness of the era. Um, and there also was a huge stock market crash in 1987. So it really worked. And then instead of researching really depressing things about the Great Depression, I was researching about like Debbie Gibson and Tiffany and Def Leppard and all of these. You exactly. Know, garbage things. pale kids and yes. garbage pale kids, which yeah. I when I was a kid, one day decided to paper my entire room. Wow with all of my garbage pail kids and my mom lost her, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, I mean, had an artistic touch, obviously. I always had age. an artistic touch, exactly. But yeah, I mean, pretty much exactly the age as Aaron is. Okay. Aaron is 11, the book takes place around 1988. I was born in 78. Um, so a lot of the book is just bringing my childhood into it as much as possible, except for the fact that my family was like completely normal and we didn't rob banks. Yeah, so but... I was going to say, so your family, aside from that, your family did not rob banks. No, um... no, 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 no. My dad worked for MetLife. He was an insurance salesman. Um, but, um, <laughs> right. the, just everything from my childhood got really infused in it. And, you know, my love of pop culture, um yeah. and film and music and you know books that i was reading at the time and all of it was just really fun to kind of bring into this book as well well i have to say it's like quite the antithesis to covid and the pandemic yeah, you know, yeah. I, I can imagine like you're the probably one of the few people that you know had fun during the pandemic in I terms mean, of your research we're researching you know strains and number of cases sure, and you're sure. researching Tiffany. I mean, I was as well. I, I live in New York City. So like, yeah. you know, we, we were in the worst of it. And the book really yes. became a, an escape, honestly. Like the book kind of saved me during COVID. It kept me yeah. sane as much as possible. And it gave me something to wake up and like, you know, write X amount of words a day. And I write most of my books in Central Park. So once I started leaving my house, like three or four weeks into it, um, okay. I just went to Central Park every day and wrote, which is what I normally do. So okay. I was able to keep just, you know, a, a, a normal kind of pattern in the midst of everything. Um, and it's weird now because, you know, we're almost four years out of it. And yeah. that's sometimes how long a book takes to <laughs> sell and come out. Um, but it, it, it brings me back to that time, you know, instantly sort of when I read it. Absolutely. So I'm joined in conversation this evening with Lee Matthew Goldberg, author and um, writer of The Great Gimmelman's um, wonderful holiday gift, stocking stuffers galore. Um, this book is for anybody who enjoys a little bit of family drama with a slice of comedy, anybody who enjoys the 80s. I mean, I just, I had a blast reading it. It brought back so many things I had forgotten yeah. about, the whole Debbie Gibson versus Tiffany, you yeah. know, <laughs> the over-the-topness of, of mall concerts, you know? Mm -hmm. I, there's a scene there and I just thought, oh my gosh, I totally forgot that they went on this whole touring malls, indoor malls, right? Because that was like the thing back then. That's my favorite scene of the book. Um, yeah. And it, I, I mean, it never happened. So the two of them, I mean, this was the research yes. that they, did. they never actually did a concert together. They were pitted in the media as like frenemies kind of. Yes. Against each other. Um, and it's a really nice little moment after they've robbed some banks, some bad stuff has happened, but not really the bad stuff, super bad stuff yet. And yeah. they, the older sister loves both of them and sees in, I think, New Orleans that they're in a mall together and the whole family, all the kids go. And they just have this moment where they kind of take a break from 
being, you know, criminals on the run. Yeah. And they're essentially to, normal for and they're just normal for a second. And then I think that's the pivot in the book. Like yes. after, you know, they, they come back and the parents are still in their whole crazy, you know, selfish world. Yes. And they look back at that as like the last moment of real sanity before yeah. It's just, you know, <laughs> like anybody robbing a bank, it's not going to turn out well. Yeah, I was going to say, this is why people don't get away with it. No, no, no. Although even, in the 80s, a better chance. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that it's set in the 80s, like mm -hmm. before all the technology and cameras everywhere yes. and cell phones yeah. and trackers and, you know, everything else, you know, they they did a an admirable job you know, given what they had to work with. Yeah. I mean, they're talented, you know, like yes. they harness their powers for good. You know, they could have, you know, yes. the world in some way, shape or form. But yeah, this book could not have taken place in 2023. They would not have no. been able to achieve the level of success, if you want to call it that, that they <laughs> exact notoriety. Exactly. Notoriety. Yeah. That they did in, in 1988. Right. You know, DNA was a very new thing. And there's even a scene where they're like, is this an issue? Like, or yeah. fingerprints a problem. And that was an interesting thing research wise to learn. I had no idea that like DNA was never just a normal thing that cops use to get criminals. But in the right. 80s, it was new. It was it was a brand new technology. Wow. How far we've come. How far we've come. Yeah, yeah. Right. You were like, now it's like you even start to think about something and somebody's showing up at your door to be like, hmm, Immediately, no. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, even like they rob a bank, there's cameras on the street, people are filming with their phones. You know, it's it to all budding bank robbers out there, like, don't do it now. Don't do it now. You'll never make it. You know, this could be the, the yeah. challenge that we throw the gauntlet down. So, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's hope not. Um, it's also a story of a father and a son, right? Mm. And how um, in the book you talk about how um, often a boy finds their father to be their hero yeah, and how this really kind of impacts, you know, a, a son, like a young person's life mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and has a tremendous impact. Um, can you talk a little bit about, about that dynamic? Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, my dad was an absolute wonderful dad. He passed about five years ago. He lived yeah. until 91. So he had a very, very full, like wonderful life. Yeah. Um, so this is not based on him in any way, shape, or form. But um, I think I was dealing from his loss because it was pretty new when yeah. I wrote it, um, sort of with that separation and the idea of, you know, the importance of a father-son relationship. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's love there between Barry, the father, and, and Aaron. Um, Aaron definitely sees him as his hero earlier on in the book. It sort of morphs when he starts calling him Barry and not dad. That's right. really the indication that things are starting to wake up, that like his dad doesn't always have his best interest. And unfortunately for Barry, um, money and sort of power, fame, all of that right. becomes a bigger importance than his own family. He gets swept up in it all. And, you know, he was a stockbroker. So he was used to like the idea Big risk. of money and risk and all of this stuff so this yeah. just fueled that and he's a cokehead so like you well, know, it, there is that <laughs> on top of that and then it right. leads down to aaron and aaron at 12 is you know trying things that he shouldn't try and everything yes. um but i think the book also is really about like forgiveness and mm -hmm. um you know especially you know dealing with like the religion aspect and the spirituality aspect and a big part of judaism is always about forgiveness um so i'm not going to spoil sort of the end but um the characters even through all of their pain and they they find a way to kind of come back i would say to right. each other yeah i um so i'm joined in conversation with uh i was gonna say the great lee <laughs> matthew goldberg yes that's Look, true I'll take I'll, it. Yeah. writer of the great gimelman's um which is what did you say like roughly three weeks yeah three weeks yeah old. yeah literally about three weeks old yeah yeah so well tomorrow it'll be three baby. yeah, yeah it's tuesday is always pub day right yep. not just for tacos it's for books if, for if you're a writer or a librarian that's how we look at tuesdays yeah yeah it's, a, so. it's always a big day it's uh you know and when a book comes out there's always the excitement but it's it's like a stressful couple weeks when a book comes out too you know i had three events this yours is the fourth event this week that oh. i've been doing so Wow. You know, fun, but like you're always hoping that they go really well, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I can't imagine anybody reading this and not liking it, not enjoying it. And and at the same time, you know, picking up the subtle messages 
mm-hmm. in it, along with the sense of humor and the sense of like, yeah, it's a family like of five <laughs> that decide to rob banks in a gas guzzling RV. I mean, Why not? <laughs> no, and, and I'll tell you what, it's a fun hand sell in the library to be like, I know exactly what you need to read. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the book pitches really well. Like we're kind yeah. of pitching it in a Hollywood angle as Little Miss Sunshine meets the Coen Brothers or <gasps> Little Miss exactly. Sunshine, Baby Driver. Although Baby Driver, I feel like now doesn't have as much recognition. So kind of going yeah. with Little Miss Sunshine meets the. Oh, Little Miss Sunshine. Yeah, absolutely. Because mm-hmm. it's that that cast of characters that somehow comes together. So I have to just ask you if you yeah. can like introduce us to the characters. So you have Barry, which sure. you know we yes. covered as Aaron's dad. Mm-hmm. You know, stockbroker loses his job because of the the crash, mm-hmm. and then you have Aaron, who's twelve, mm-hmm. and his his older sister. Yeah, his older sister, Steph, who's obsessed with boys and pop tunes um, and is smarter than she comes off. So she plays dumb kind of very well, but she's really Mm -hmm. not. And she's very astute. And she's almost a little bit like a pseudo mom in the absence. The the mom, Judith, is there, but she's kind of medicated for a lot of it (laughs) for the most part, um, you know, for better or worse. Um, So there's moments where kind of Steph steps in and becomes um you know big sister but also mom to aaron and then there's jenny who's the best of all the characters because you don't know what you're gonna get she's a terror and she torches and tortures animals yes um, and she 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 doesn't carry a stuffed animal in the traditional stuffed animal no, sense that we not. know right Can yeah tell everybody who seymour is sure so seymour the in in oh, an to get her to stop torturing animals, <laughs> parents got her a taxidermied opossum. It's <laughs> um, a line I never of, thought I'd hear anybody say. No, kind of the bridge between, you know, a real animal and a stuffed animal. Yes. Um, and Seymour's her best friend. Jenny is somebody who doesn't connect really with anybody. She beats to her own drum completely. Um, mm-hmm. She says whatever is on her mind. And she's a psychopath at the same time. Um, <laughs> in but, an RV with people robbing banks. In an RV with people robbing banks. But she has a very good shot as well. So, like, you know, at, there's moments where Jenny comes to the rescue. Right. In in the book. Um, and she's a fantastic bank robber at the age of, I think she's like seven in the book, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yes, yeah, Exactly. Who can manufacture tears on command. Manufacture tears on command. And yeah. she's probably one of the most favorite characters I've ever created. Like she's just pure joy to write. <laughs> Absolutely. She's, uh, you know, she's quite fun. Um, there's at one point where she refers to herself as a ghost. Like a lot of times, you yeah. know, she just kind of pops in where she's needed and people kind of suddenly realize she's mm-hmm. there, but most of the time they're just kind of unaware of who she is and what she's doing. So yes, to your point, she's, she's yeah, great. I, you know, I mean, we're, she's intended mostly as comic relief in, you know, the best sense, but there's a real sadness about her. Yes. Um, and she kind of breaks your heart, I think, you know, more than anybody in, in the book. And, and, and like you said, that's, that's a perfect point. She thinks of herself as a ghost because unless she's going over the top and doing the most out there things. Right. She's not noticed basically, you know, in, in this family of other characters that kind of take over everybody, everybody is like best in show almost in the family. That's, that's exactly right. And so how you put it, it makes me think of, you know, um, way back when, when uh, MTV had the real world where you have like seven strangers picked to live in yeah. a house, yeah. you know, it's like you got five family members picked to rob banks living in an RV. Yeah. So yeah. there's a, there was a show road rules and they were in the, it was the real world yeah. in the RV. And I was a huge fan of that show. And um, not that directly this was based on it, but like right. a little bit was, was remembered from that show because when I was thinking of, you know, a receptacle that they would all be, you know, station wagon, it was too like contained. And, yeah. you know, I always think of like, if this is going to be a TV show, if this is going to be a film, it lend itself better if it was all taking place in this like really big RV that you could like fully live in kind of and film in and, and right. all that. So that was why I chose it as well. Well, it's, it's perfect because I, dynamics, change when people yeah. are traveling together and that's like yeah. the true test of relationships right like <laughs> yeah, yeah you totally. can work with somebody yeah you can you know mm-hmm. date somebody but okay like spend you know up teen hours in a car with them 
and you kind of go either like this is a pass or a fail, right? And then yeah, yeah, five people who have well four, five people total, but four people who have such gigantic personalities, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and then there's Jenny who's kind of often overlooked, but mm -hmm. really shouldn't be. So yeah, I mean, in some ways, you know, it you know, especially towards the beginning, like I think the family really <laughs> unites in in a very beautiful way at the beginning because they were just too busy for each other with life, basically. Um, and so there's an excitement when they first start robbing. And, you know, it, it's kind of like two of them know it's happening and then another one learns about it and another one learns about it until right. like, the whole family kind of gets on board. Um, but they, they, they definitely like become more of a family, you know, obviously that can't last forever. Um, right. But I think if you would interview each of them, the beginning of the trip would be one of the best times of each of their lives. Probably. Oh, absolutely. And it started, and then this isn't giving anything away, sure. innocently yeah. enough with the fact that they're in the gas guzzling RV and they mm -hmm. don't know how they're going to continue to pay for gas to drive. Right. Yeah. And so Aaron, who's all of 12, decides, mm -hmm. you know what, I'll just rob this convenience store, mm -hmm. you know, and, and as you know, all those things like, you know, we do sometimes not so great things for the right reasons, you know, right. it's, it's to help mm -hmm. his family survive. Yeah. Essentially, yeah. Right. Where yeah. they lose their house, they lose their possessions. They, mm -hmm. you know, the opening scenes are about, you know, things being repossessed and they're just watching their life being carted out by strangers, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, and thankfully the strangers did not notice the RV tucked in the back behind the woods to know it was there and right. gives them some means of escape. Yeah. You know, I, and I think it's actually Jenny who's like, Hey, I think we have a really kind of crappy RV. Like, yeah, let's use that. Like, let's hop in that. Um, but yeah, I mean, Aaron, Aaron is very wise beyond his years. Yes. He's, you know, like a 40 year old and 12 year olds body basically. Yeah. Um, and at first he really, I mean, he looks so much up to Barry. So I think he really wants to like, impress him and he yeah. hears that they're having you know obviously a lot of money issues they don't even have enough money to get to florida to visit you know their grandma basically which is mm -hmm. where they were originally headed um and he's kind of like fight or flight like i yeah. can help my family like let me just take a little bit it's not going to be a big deal and then it just kind of snowballs it almost was like that was what they always were meant to be doing so like the minute the idea gets lodged yes. in barry's head he runs with it and they go after a liquor store and then a yes. small bank and then a bigger bank, you know, and then it, and, yeah. and, until they really kind of take on more than they could possibly ever handle. Yeah. So if you're going to be a uh, family of criminals robbing banks, think small. Think small. Yeah. Yeah. Small. You know, had they stayed yeah. small, things would be all right. And also, yeah. like, don't trust anybody outside of the family. Even no. other family members that aren't in the direct unit of the family. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm joined in conversation by uh, with Lee Matthew Goldberg, uh, writer of The Great Gimmelman's Go Out and Buy, add it to the top of your TBR pile. You will not be disappointed. Such a wonderful read. Can you talk a little bit about why you chose to tell it from Aaron's perspective? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it was something I kind of struggled with a little at the first um i've written a book before where it was like multiple povs yes. so at one point i thought it might be that um but there was something about aaron's voice aaron i think is of all of my characters and all the 14 books i've written i yeah. think the closest to what i was at that age okay. he's mischievous and he's kind of a smart ass and he really was just what i was like at 11 in terms of my humor and Yes. I grew up in New York City and I grew up very fast. Like we were going, we'd fake IDs at 14 and going to bars and clubs and everything. Yeah. Um, so his, his voice was really just calling to me and mm -hmm. it just really made sense to tell it through it. Um, the difficulty <clears throat> became that there's moments where he's telling about parts of the story that he yes. was not actually in. Um, so I worked with, I always work with a freelance editor, even before I give it to my agent and a, and okay. a book. So, um, an, an editor that I've worked with, um, for many of my books. Um, and he was like, we still have to somehow make it that he knew about it. So we set it where he's like looking back and he's like, these are from news reports or, and he's kind of reimagining yeah. it. And then once I had that all settled, 
I felt very comfortable with him really telling the entire story. And then also having it, the, the last minute edition was the prologue and the epilogue. So okay. the original book never had that. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. And then when my agent was about to send it out, he was like, it's reading a little too young adult. Um, what if we met up with him in present time? Right. And it kind of just clicked. And in like a weekend, I wrote the the prologue and the epilogue and we like sent it right out. <laughs> it's, it, out. it has a bit of um like a, a stand by me. And I mean that as a compliment because it's sure. one of my favorite okay. movies. It's oh, the okay. adult looking back. Yeah. Telling the story, um, which just does so well because he's driving his teenage son mm -hmm. to come and stay with him because, you know, he had gotten divorced. Right and, it, right. and the mom says, I can't deal with your, you know, our son anymore. So he's going to go live with you. And of course, you know, the kid's a surly teenager in the car and yeah. doesn't want to talk and wants to listen to headphones, you know, earbuds, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. AirPods and, you know. It gave the, of like history repeating itself basically. Yes. Um, so we see Aaron at 45 or however old he is, um, yeah. really making a lot of the same mistakes that his father did um, with him. And because he grew up in such an insane lifestyle, like how yes. could he possibly be normal and actually be like a proper parent? Um, so it, 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 it allowed that aspect of Aaron to, and because you meet him later, mm -hmm. uh, I think that carries with you throughout the book. And he's not just like a little kid. He's somebody who you do meet in midlife as right. well. And then even like I was saying, I always think about like a movie or, you know, a yes. TV series. Um, it's a great other, you know, role for an actor that could right. play Aaron at 45. And it's not just about Aaron at 12. Um, right. So all of those I things. I cannot wait till it's on the big screen. I mean, it's just a matter of time, right? Keep, keep your fingers crossed. I'm, I'm working on it. Um, yeah. yeah, I just got, not that it might happen, but there's a very large director that I started talking to randomly um, through Twitter. And I he agreed to allow me to send him a copy. So we well, will see from there. That's sort well, of, the, yeah. Well, that's how we met. You posted something on Twitter about readers. And, oh, is that really? No. That was yeah. how it was? Yeah. Oh, and I then it was like, oh, DM awesome. me. And I was like, wait, seriously? Like, oh, all right. Wow. Just, oh, yeah. awesome. Yeah, no, I mean. You just never know how, you know, sometimes no, things just I mean, drop into your lap. You know, Twitter is a cesspool in a lot of ways. But yes. I think purely if you use it as, you know, like for promo and, for networking and for you know the ability to like meet people that you never necessarily would meet in you know or adjacent to this you know writing world um so no that's fantastic i'm so happy that this came yeah. through that like i think i like i was at home when it happened and i literally like shrieked like oh my god this is so cool and you were like oh yeah i'm open let's just let's pick some dates and i was like holy cow this is awesome yeah, yeah. no i mean i i knew some other authors who had done or was about to do series with you okay. um so that was like an i mean it was a no-brainer but like i also i mean especially in terms of like when a book comes out it's like you, if somebody asks you to do you know promo yeah it's a blessing like yeah. it, it's it's amazing so you like for any writers out there it's like say yes to everything basically yeah even though it'll be a little nutty and it might be a little stressful but you know overall it's it's worth it and we and we all get to connect with you in a in a different way yeah um, and yeah. hear more of like the story behind the story which is always really mm -hmm. interesting um yeah you know writing is such a solitary profession that when a book comes out you really have the you know the opportunity to like talk about what you've been working on i mean like i said i started this in 2020 we're almost 4 years out from starting this book um yeah, like it's it's nice to finally be able to talk about it after all this time. Absolutely. Can you? We talked a little bit before. You mentioned that you like to write in Central Park. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. do you bring like a laptop, or are you somebody mm -hmm. who you know does longhand, or are you, you know, somebody who knows what the, it's the whole typical question? That now it's like architect or gardener versus plotter. Right. Or, right. 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 So, yeah. I've. I. I mean, I, I grew up in New York. I've lived here my whole life, and yeah. I've always had a really special relationship with Central Park. Um, and then, I don't know, about a dozen years ago, I found this tree and I just started writing books under it. And it's like, it's my tree. I know it's not, but like, there's- yeah, it is, it is now. No, I mean, there's- <laughs> There's gonna be a little plaque. Lee Matthew Goldberg writes here. Okay, here's the, th it costs like $12,000 to get the tree, your name on one of those trees. So that's not happening. I got a Sharpie and I was just in New York City this weekend. So I could have, 
just write it. Um, but it's like a little off the beaten path of a yeah. busy area. So it's often not really populated, but there's like a bathroom not that far. There's a hot dog cart to get water. Um, so I have all my essentials and pretty yeah. much from like April through November, you know, today I almost went there. It was it's like 50 degrees in New York today. Yeah. And I almost went Unusual. there. A to little be too cold, like just a hint too cold to be there for like four or five hours. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's something about this tree. And I don't know, I, I leave my body when I'm working there way easier than anywhere else. And I go to somewhere and sometimes I don't even remember what I wrote. And it's just kind of there. Wow. It, yeah. I mean, I've heard other writers talk about it in that way. But when I'm working in nature, um, it happened. It, I'm, I'm more accessible to that. And that's when the writing is really, really is good. Is that because you're like free of, of the typical distractions? I so, I mean, it's it's getting so much harder to not be distracted. Yes. Um, and like sometimes I'll, you know, with my phone, um, have the Wi-Fi connection connected to my computer if I'm really doing like a lot of research. But most yeah. of the time I don't. And I kind of just put my phone down for three hours and some cool. yeah like write and usually I, I i'm on average like five pages a day when i'm into something that's yeah so and how do you keep it all straight right? because i imagine i mean you wrote this like four years ago yeah so you've done stuff between now and then so you yeah. have stuff that is probably in the editing process stuff that is ready to come out stuff that you're noodling and starting to work on mm -hmm. so how do you keep all of those storylines straight yeah, I just have a weird brain like that. I usually have a book marinating while I'm working on another book or like a script or, you know, something like that. So I just finished a new novel. It, finally, the, the book that I wanted to write in the 1930s, I, I wrote. Okay. Um, but it's, it's a very, very dark and depressing book. And it's um, set in the 1937. And it's about the only Jewish man that starts working for... Um, like a burgeoning Madison Avenue advertising firm and okay. he deals with, you know, kind of slurs and, you know, sides here and there, but he's really moving up in society. So he sticks okay. with it. Um, and then he starts noticing what he thinks is subliminal Nazi messaging in the Ooh. adverts. And he doesn't know if his mind is being played with or if literally it's run by Nazis. And it kind of taps into like the paranoia of that error. Um, yeah. And the lightning storm that's about to hit the world. Um, so it was very heavy research this year um, working on it. And I've just recently finished it. Um, and thank you. Um, and I only have had a few beta readers and my freelance editor, my agent hasn't even read it yet. Like I've, I'm taking it slow with this one. Yeah. Well, that's going to be um, a fascinating read. For thank sure. you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm really proud of it. And it's called Sublime Evil. And if you say it really fast, it's sublim subliminal. Oh. <gasps> Clever. See, I, before I became a librarian, I was in marketing and advertising and sales. Yeah. So like, you know, all the things, the nuances and the colors and the text mm -hmm. and how, yeah. So this, this will be an incredible read. So yeah, no, the research was, I mean, there was the very dark research, you know, yes. war and, you know, the, the yeah. rise of Nazism and fascism throughout the world. And also, you know, New York, which I didn't know yeah. too much about. But then also really researching like the birth of adver the birth of advertising and all that research was really, really cool and fascinating to do. And we see it a lot in like the Mad Men 50s era, like we're comfortable yes. with that. But advertising really began in 1927 in the city. And, you know, there's really nothing that I've ever seen about like when it began. And they really were just <laughs> throwing everything at the wall. Um, so it was cool. And and I have an idea for a sequel if it if it goes there, that would be said. When it goes before. there. Yeah. No, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's really great. So Thank I'm you. joined in conversation with uh, Lee Matthew Goldberg, writer of The Great Gimbledon's um, wonderful story. So can we talk a little bit about how the roles are reversed in this book? Sure. You know, mm -hmm. that the parents aren't really functioning like parents, at least not the parents I had or sounds like the parents you had growing up. No, 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 no. no, no. The opposite of my parents. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the parents in some ways become the children, the children become the parents. Um, mm -hmm. the parents, you know, they were, they came of age in the 60s and mm -hmm. they have this very kind of like hippie free love kind of vibe to them um, that got stifled when Barry was started working as a stockbroker and, mm -hmm. you know, corporate 80s kind of America. And once he's kind of free of those, you know, those, those shackles, he mm -hmm. for, you know, almost forms back into his, hippie self and yeah. his wife as well. And they're hot messes. I mean, there's, <laughs> yeah. there's no better way to put it. Like 
you right. know, they purely exist in their own little bubble, sometimes to the detriment of the kids where they're not even allowed access to it. Um, right. And they just get so swept up in this fantasy of, you know, money in excess. And I think that they would even say it was more than that. It was like, they lost the adrenaline in their lives. And this was like a direct, like Hit. shot of adrenaline that probably saved their marriage. Actually, I don't think they would admit that, but I think right. things would have not remained great had things continued normally. And that this was just this like ball of excitement that was thrown in their lap. Um, yeah. and because of that, the kids have to, you know, the, the kids have to parent and the parents are on drugs. So like, yes. you know, <laughs> they're not always lucid and no. able to do normal functioning things right. and the, the kids have to step in. So they, they grow up very, very fast, unfortunately, but I think they're all quite mature, you know, for their age going into it even. Absolutely. And I think Aaron is the one who talks a little bit about, um, can't imagine a world without his parents. Yeah. You know, and he talks about wanting to be kind of free of the responsibility mm -hmm. of having to parent parents. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, and at the same time, you know, it doesn't mean he would not have them in his life. It's just he wouldn't have to live with them and experience that that I guess selfishness over and sure. over and over again yeah. at the expense of like, are we gonna eat today? Or, you know, what are we gonna do? Or what mm -hmm. about you know, all these other things that, you know, you're supposed to kind of do as a parent. So it's like, it's not like one switch goes off in Aaron's head, but it's like a slow, like, you know, acceleration of light almost. Yes. That more and more, he's like, this is not right. And the, you know, the love interest. Yes. Yeah, so it's just about to, yeah. Um, Heidi, who kind of yeah. gets swept up in their world too who's also a very precocious, wise beyond her years, right. girl of 11, who loves like the Smiths and Depeche yes. Mode and everything. Um, mm -hmm. She's really the one who's like, you need to check your life. Like this is not going to turn out well and start writing down everything that your parents do if ever you need to turn on them basically. So, yeah. you know, she, she's like the little ray of hope that kind of comes in and then, you know, it gets dashed. Right. But at the same time, and she doesn't have it easy either. No, no. You know, she's living with her brother and an uncle. The, the grandfather. Grandfather, yeah, her okay, parents, grandfather. who Her parents died very young. They were in like a horrible car accident. When right. She was like a toddler. So she's no memory of them. And her grandfather raised them. But the grandfather is like out to lunch. Like he yes. has a gun collection and he just watches TV all day, you yeah. know, so and drinks. So like. And she I'm really thinking the like people's court is probably playing, you know. Yeah, the people's court or like <laughs> current cool. affair, or, you know, yeah. like whatever people were watching in '88. Um, yeah. And her older brother, you know, I think is he's a good guy, but I don't think he wanted to be saddled with this. Like, I have to basically raise he's my, my sister. Yeah, yeah, and he's like, you know, he's he's a good looking, kind of popular guy. So he's he was always doing his own thing, basically. Yeah. Um, which winds up happening when he kind of starts robbing the banks with the Gibble yes. and, you know, Heidi's kind of left in her, you know, prefab yeah. <laughs> uh, trailer that she lives in and kind of stuck in yeah. it, you know? So I think they connect in that way. I mean, Aaron grew up very rich, but then loses everything. So they both kind of have nothing when they meet a little bit. And I think they connect over that. Absolutely. They, they do. Um, so I'm joined in conversation with um, the great Lee Matthew Goldberg, author of The Great Gimmelmans. Um, so, you know, I guess the thing is, is that the thing that I noticed in this book is as human beings, right? No matter the age, um, no matter the decade in which we're living, is that we all kind of crave somebody's attention. And I think at yeah. one point you talk about Aaron kind of craving the attention of his father like a junkie, which is ironic mm -hmm. considering, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, yes. he could have yes. gone yeah. down the junkie road as he was experimenting with what was in the glove, you know. Yeah, yeah. Department. His dad is a full addiction because his dad yeah. is exciting and, you know, you never know what you're going to get. And he's the only son. He has two sisters. Yeah. So there's a different bond between them that, you know, mm -hmm. the rest of the family is a little bit left out of, you know, not to the detriment, but just because, you know, a father and son relationship is different than a father daughter relationship right. or a mother and son relationship. 
Um, so he's, you know, he's this hero for a while. And especially because, you know, Barry made them a lot of money and he gave him everything he wanted in life, you know, right. growing up and they had a huge house in New Jersey. And so he was yeah. never warm for anything. Um, and, it, you know, it isn't until, like I said, you know, it, it, the light starts to go on a little bit more and more and more. And I don't remember the moment exactly, but when he, like I was saying, starts calling his father, Barry. Yes. Barry does not. Kind of a like, separation. Yeah. It's, 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 it's starting, like you said, like a separation, like I think a healthy separation for yes. Adam. Like I need to keep you at a distance. You're really not always dad. So like for me to call you that, it's almost yeah. disrespectful to like dads basically. Right. And I think it's also like the power dynamic. So the power dynamic starts to shift a little bit too. And mm -hmm. that's the power that Aaron has when he calls his father, Barry, and Barry doesn't like that. You right. know, like Aaron kind of checks like, yeah, like I know which button now to push. You right. Know which button to push. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that's the thing that's fascinating. You, you alluded to um, Aaron earlier as kind of being this 40 year old trapped in like the 12 year old's body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's certain, you know, experiences that that he has throughout the book, you know, his, mm -hmm. his love interest of Heidi, who kind of gives him some perspective. And then, you know, his perspective that, you know, he has with Jenny, who makes some observations, sure. right. Mm -hmm. And then his mm -hmm. older sister, right. And I just think like, yeah, I mean, how, how much of an old soul this character has mm -hmm. to be able mm -hmm. to pick up on those things and then start to figure out, not just do the, oh, you know, what was me? I can't do anything, but right. Right, what can I do? Yeah, I mean, he's a genius. Like he's, yes. you know, he even at the beginning kind of builds himself that way. Like school is boring for him because yes. he doesn't have to pay attention. He could do anything. And, you know, he doesn't get good grades because he's bored, but like he could yeah. get A's no problem. Um, right. So he's definitely somewhat of an of an old soul and, you know, like wise beyond his years. And, you know, you, you, you like that at, for a narrator because... Yes. He always has his eyes on everything that's happening. So he could tell this story well. And literally the story is an audio book, basically in the book. You know, yes. you, you, you learn from very beginning. He's playing the audio book version of his life that became a huge, huge bestseller right. um, for his son now as like a warning. Um, so who better than like a genius like Aaron to like write the tale and again, going back to the Heidi character, she's the one that kind of puts that bug in his ear, like, write this down, tell your story. And he starts kind of, you know, getting journal entries down about everything that happens. Also painting him in the best light because he's not stupid. So, right. you know, he paints his parents in the worst light possible. And, you know, not that he should be to blame, but he's also not 100% innocent. It's, you know. No, I mean... None of none of them are. None you know? of them I mean, are. They all play a role, which is and and have a certain gift yes. that they hone in order to make it all work until yeah it possibly yeah the, the Gilmans wouldn't work without one of them like right. they're like you said they're all required to be successful and I think they wind up I don't remember the exact figure but it was like over a million dollars in the eighties yeah. too which is right so like, like in today's money that would be. I don't a know, like three million an hour. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, a good amount more. So, you know, they really were like, you know, almost made to do this in life. It was like life picked this RV and it kind of sent them on this path, basically. Yeah. Um, and they were powerless to stop it because once it got started, it the energy connected to it, there was no way to get off the RV. Basically. No, I mean, it is as dangerous as it is and as, you know, illegal as it is, there is some fun to be yeah. able to to win at that game there's and like a quote, and not wanting to let the other family member down either i mean so sure. there's that dynamic too it's like well dude i i can't mess up because you know mom and barry and they all have a role to play and you yeah you're right it wouldn't work without one of them you know it's really funny i've had some people reach out already who obviously their family was not on this level but like people who's parents are like a little bit of like a con artist or live like a super party lifestyle or wow. yeah like people have reached out connecting with the book already who had these that's terrific kind of, yeah I mean, that's like, terrific that that's the upbringing they had right because this is a book absolutely. right but um, in the, or, in the sense or that, it like, that it was too much you know that like it 
almost trauma related. Like it brought back too many memories of that kind of, you know, unsteady time in their life. Um, right. Where I'm like, push on, like, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, Take I, a break. Come back tomorrow. Make, come back tomorrow. You know, uh, yeah. But I, I, that was not something I expected. You know, no. that people actually had con artists of, you know, families. And there was, there's a book, The Family Fang, that I, I had read by Kevin Wilson. And it was made into yeah. oh, I, not, not an amazing movie with Nicole Kidman, but like a movie. Um, yeah. And I loved that book. So like the quirkiness of the family kind of I was originally inspired by that, that book. Yeah. Um, uh, those are my favorite books to read is those that have characters that are just a little bit quirky and yeah. make it all work. Yeah. I mean, and all of Kevin Wilson's books are, you know, yeah, lauded for that. Like he's just a genius in terms of yes. comedy and everything. Um, but I also was reading a lot of just like 80s books that I grew up with. I was reading well beyond what I should. So I remember reading like Bright Lights, Big City by Jay McInerney. I think I was like 10 or 11. Like I probably well, should, but look, it. Well, it, it look, growing, growing up in roughly the same era, right? We yeah. went right from like, you know, Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew, mm -hmm. Judy Bloom to adult there. Yes. You have given, you know, kids and, you know, young adults a mm -hmm. gift today with your young adult series, right? The, the trilogy, right? So yes. that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, young adults build up to the concept right, like, of young adult say, didn't agree. exist. So once you kind of aged out of like, and I, I love the Hardy Boys, and instead yeah. of Leah Brown was another one of my favorite. Yeah, like solve mysteries and stuff. Absolutely, yeah, um, that's what I read all the time as a kid. But then you know, I hit like nine, ten, and I was like, like, uh, give me more. The formula, right? Yeah, yeah, and. I, I went to a great school. I went to like a friend's school, the, you know, the Quaker schools all over the country. And we just yeah. had fantastic teachers and they always like pushed us ahead of what we should be reading. Yeah. Um, and my parents really never monitored anything in terms of like <laughs> movies and everything. Like they were like, you have, you love to write, like take it all in basically. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah. So like I, Twin Peaks was like a huge inspiration. I think I was like 11 when I watched that. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember reading Bright Lights, Big City, which is about a, you know, <laughs> drug addicted stockbroker, I think he yes. is, um, probably at like 11 or 12. So uh, like a lot of that kind of commonality with Aaron and right. came from um, those books of my youth as well. Yeah. So I'm, I'm joined in conversation uh, this evening with the, um, Lee Matthew Goldberg, uh, author of The Great Gimmelmans. Um, you know, it's a story ultimately about family, right? And how tough mm -hmm. times, you know, bring us together and sometimes mm -hmm. kind of pull us apart. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm struck by, you alluded to it earlier, the the religion and the spirituality that appears yeah. throughout the book. Because there are a couple of terms that you use that mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of just- Sure, uh, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, no, to talk a little bit about, um, because I had a grandma, Bernice, which is- Oh, really? Of, yeah, oh. my mom's mom. Yeah. Oh, wow. My well, mom's mom was Grandma Beatrice, who was nothing like this grandma, but yeah. it was a little bit of a of, of a nod to her. Yeah, it just, uh, same name. I was like, oh, cool. Like, you know, there's yeah. a Grandma Byrne in this book. I can get behind nice, this for nice. sure. Yeah. He's a great um, character. I mean. Absolutely. She, she talks um, a little bit about um, the Jewish custom of mitzvah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you share a little bit about sure. that with us? Yeah, I mean, mitzvah on, on a base level is just a good deed. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's often like do mitzvahs throughout your day, always kind of be doing them throughout your life. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you have a bar mitzvah at 13 for boys, 12 for um, girls. And, you know, it's the kind of transition from childhood to manhood or womanhood. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, mitzvah is really just like doing good deeds and being a good person. And that's, you know, really what it's, what it's promoting. And, you know, grandma Bernice is tough. She yes. doesn't take shit from anybody, exactly. uh, uh, but she's, she's orthodox and she's very, very, you know, strict in her beliefs and her belief system. And then this, you know, roller coaster of a family comes living with her that are the antithesis of mitzvahs and good deeds. Yes. Um, but she's very loyal and loving, I think, in her own way towards Absolutely. the kid, definitely. And her daughter, who she really lost, kind of. 
Yes. I, and I think the thing I was struck by is her talking to Aaron about forgiveness. Yeah. And sometimes it's, it's, it's about timing. Like, mm -hmm. so that is it, a, it is a genuine forgiveness mm -hmm. rather than just a, you know, you have to. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's the thing that's interesting because that's when you would want it when it's genuine, you don't want somebody to say they're sorry if they don't really mean right, it or right. for somebody to say, I accept your apology really, I'm still ticked and, you know, mm -hmm. blasting you on social media or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, so I struck by that too, which I thought is a very thoughtful gesture. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, at, at the core of the book, it's really about forgiveness, you know, that yeah. is what I would want people to take family. Absolutely. But also, you know, um, a, a big part of Jewish culture is, you know, to forgive people, even for the worst things that they do, basically. Mm -hmm. And it, the book wouldn't work if, the family somehow doesn't forgive each other. Right. Um, they go through this horrible, horrible experience and, you know, horrible things really happen and it pains, you know, and it could be 20 years, 30 years, but there's still an element of, you know, you're human and at your core, you still deserve to be forgived. Um, right. I think it's a good message, you know, in these yeah. times. I think we could all benefit from, you know, taking. Yeah. You know, today. like, yeah. Be empathic and see, step into other people's shoes and, you know, understand what they're going through in their life and yeah. you know, be able to forgive them at some point when you're ready, you know, like, like you said, not just because you feel like you have to, because you genuinely don't want to carry around that burden yeah. of anger and, you know, pain anymore. And Absolutely. there's something very like releasing, I think, to forgive people. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you noticed that. Cause I think that's the most important aspect of the book. Yeah. I, um, I noticed it and I, and it made me think of, you know, somebody else that, that I read, um, nonfiction wise, but she'll say, sometimes people are just doing the best they can. Right. We're all so doing the best. Be what we do yeah. or what we would choose, but sometimes what that person is doing that has, mm -hmm. you know, hurt us or offended us that sometimes they're just doing the best they can. And that has kind of changed how I look at a lot mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think otherwise you carry so much stuff with you and I'd rather what? have room for good than. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, it's very easy. I think, you know, us as, as a writer, we have to be em empathetic. You know, we yeah. go into other people's shoes all, all day, time. basically. Yeah. All our characters, you know, I, I had my book, The Mentor was about a killer. I had yes. to go into his shoes, but he had a past that led up to that where he was abused and the cycle right. continued. Um, but I think it's sometimes very hard for people outside of that. I do this for my, you know, daily job, but for other people right. to step into other people's shoes and, you know, realize like, you know, a, a lot of people are just doing the best that they can and yeah. not hold that always against them. And that, you know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, with, with, without a doubt. And I think that's the, the gift that you as writers give us as readers is that mm -hmm. ability to step inside somebody else's shoes and see things from a different perspective. Yeah, right. I mean, that help yeah. develop that sense of empathy, like, wow, okay, like, yeah. kind of understanding the why somebody does something doesn't necessarily make it better. But mm -hmm. sometimes it's a little bit more palatable. That makes yeah, sense. I mean, you know, Barry's a perfect example. He's, he's easy to like, for some of the book, because yeah. he's funny, and he's wacky, and you know, yeah. you can get, but he's quite hard to like towards the end. Right. Um, but he's human. Yeah. yeah, at his core, and he's fallible. Yeah. And if somebody's able to admit their fallibility and you yeah. know apologize for something that they've done wrong to you, um, and the apology is you know sincere, you know why hold on to it? Like, yeah. forgive. Yeah, I mean that you you captured kind of the essence of life, right? Like you know, there's 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 good and bad, and they exist at the same time. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if we can choose more good you know? Yeah. I, I mean, abs absolutely. You know, I, I hope in, in the midst of everything, you know, like the book is funny and I want it to be a great ride, but yeah. you know, I do think it has, like you said, some of those deeper um, intentions and, you know, that a more astute reader could like pick up on some of that and take it with them. And the one, the great thing about fiction is a book becomes a different thing for everybody. And yeah you know, as an author, it's like, it's not mine anymore. It's everybody else's and they yeah. can decide what they want to do with it. And like, really like nobody has hated this one so far. Like, no. 
And and if so, I think that's like a troll. Like there's no way anybody yeah, it's a troll or it's the great Gimmelmans by Lee Matthew Goldberg. There's no way. No, it's a troll or it's like there is an aspect now of people who read to hate books. So like they look to see what they will be offended by or, you know, it will be against their principles or whatever. So there's always that now as a writer right. where you get somebody who's just going to hate it from start to finish. But I always say like there was one of them I saw on like Goodreads or something or they like tweeted it. Yeah. And it's like you still read the whole book. So yeah. like uh -huh, hated, it. <laughs> hated it, but like you yeah. loved to hate it. <laughs> exactly. You know, yeah. and then like you felt so compelled to then talk about it. So thank you again. That's fantastic. I think the worst thing that could be for an author is someone who's just bored and they like gave up on the book. Like if you read it and you hated it, great. Like yeah. that's awesome. You know, it, yeah. it, it 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 enacted like a visceral reaction. Yeah. You know, I'm cool with that. Um, but this one more than all of my other books so far, like people are really like loving. So this it's, it's this really is great. Cool. I mean, it, it starts off. I mean, I know we were joking at the very beginning about you know like a family, you know in a RV, you know, gas guzzling RV, you know, robbing banks across the country. Um, but, you know, at the heart of it, there's the, the nuances of, mm -hmm. of life and makes yeah. it such a wonderful book to discuss with people. You know, once you get past <laughs> Seymour <laughs> and some of the other things, but it's just, it's laugh out loud, funny. And at the same time, incredibly tender, poignant moments Thank that exist you. throughout. So. Yeah. I, you know, I think like I was saying, my original, intention of it was to be like a very depressing book that took place in the 30s and to have like all those points that we mentioned um but you know it, i don't think it would have hit in the same way i think it, mm -hmm. it it would have been a tougher read and i don't know the the the, the gilman's always just called out to me to like exist in 1988 and listen to tiffany and yeah um, yeah you know, like with their like walkman and, and everything like you know, yeah they, they yeah they were always meant to be who they wound up becoming a okay. um, couple last minute questions before sure. we get to the final yeah, five. Absolutely. So um, can you tell us a little bit about the Gorilla Lit reading? Sure. Um, so yeah, for about 15 years, I've ran the Gorilla Lit reading series um, and it's in New York City. Um, and we're actually on a pause right now. The two curators that I run it with, they're a married couple and they moved to Sicily very recently. So um, <laughs> I'm running it myself um, and I just needed to just take a pause Step with back. it. Yeah. Um, but we'll be back. And we're usually at this place, the Dixon place, which is a great speakeasy bar down on the Lower East Side. And Gorilla will be back in, in some form, absolutely. Um, and we have three readers read, um, usually who have books coming out at the time. And it's been a fantastic experience, you know, for, for the last 15 years. So I'm, I'm not going to let go of it just yet. Good. This is encouraging. Um, so this visit, Writers Unplugged, is about Cleveland Reads and about okay. literacy. Mm -hmm. Will you talk a little bit about why literacy is important to you? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's so important for, you know, a, a, a just, you know, if, if, if you have struggle, if you're struggling to learn how to read, to be able to read, and that no book is ever, you know, denied from anybody that, you know, mm -hmm. this idea of banning books and things like that is just, you know, like I just finished a book about fascism in the 30s. And that's basically what it is. It's, you know, it's it's horrible. Um, yes. And, that you know, the wonderful thing about especially fiction is fiction is subjective. You know, mm -hmm. some people love something, some people hate something, but like we're Americans, you should have the right to decide if you love or hate it, you know? Right. Um, and I think regardless of whatever career path you wind up in, the core foundation of being a reader and knowing how to read and analyze for mm -hmm. any career that you go into will, will only help. So it's super important. And I'm so thankful for all the libraries that are fighting the good fight right now. Yeah. and. Um, supporting literacy and you know um keeping books in you yeah. know kids and adults hands well like i mean it's the symbiotic relationship you know librarians have with writers if you didn't do sure. the wonderful job you do i have nothing to do right yeah libraries well, are libraries are just fantastic i mean like i take up books from my local library all the time um good. Books are expensive and not everybody has the budget to like spend thirty dollars on the shelf a space, book. right? For the shelf space. I live in Manhattan. Like that's you know, you could yes. see books behind me. Like I have no room for books anymore. Um yeah. so yeah, libraries are 
you know, a, a wonderful thing. And in New York, it's fantastic. There's like uh, a million of them. You plug yeah. in the book you want and like in two days, you get it's the book, there. whatever yeah. book you want. Like, Yeah, it's books. awesome. I visited um, the New York Public Library, the Research Library, right? And then Those across the today. street to, their, yeah. to the relatively new circulating library that has- yes. Yeah, they've really fabulous. did that very nicely. That one was kind of hurting for a while. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I, I was talking about writing in Central Park in you yeah. know nice weather. Um, but in the winter time, I usually write in the the Lion Library, the main library. Yeah. Um, well, that, so I, well, that ceiling. I mean, how could you? That ceiling. Yeah. There. There's this place, Rose. If you're ever in New York City, um, it's it's a wonderful visit. You could do like yeah. a tour, just go on your own, yeah. and it's like walking into the Sistine Chapel. I'm not lying. Yeah. It's it's gorgeous. And yeah. I'm working on now a, a collection of horror short stories. It's just kind mm -hmm. of like a little a side thing that I'm doing. Um, yeah. And I was working on a horror short story in that library in the, that room today. Yeah. Wow. Fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was at the Morgan Museum and Library. Oh, yeah, you know, I and I was park. like, okay, I don't feel so bad about the number of books I have. And I was like, yes. well, look yeah, what I, yeah, have. Yeah. I don't yeah, have the, the first edition. The Morgan Library is, is fantastic. And it often has really great like literary, like I, yeah. I saw a Babar exhibit there that was wonderful yeah. and a Hemingway exhibit. And I think like, one of the oldest Bibles they have in existence there. It's just, yeah, I mean, just I was just am but... amazed with, with the collection. I mean, even yeah. down to the, the statue of Shakespeare down on the yeah, wall, yeah. I could not stop looking at it to think and that that was like, just a gesture for fun because he knew he liked them. So I'm like, right. oh, yeah, I'll and just it's, it's an also this up. path, New York tourist, like m most tourists don't go to it. it it's not, yeah super super well known but if you love you know books and and libraries yeah um and they have like art you know there's fantastic art exhibits too so like yeah you know, go to the morgan go to the morgan okay final five questions okay let's do okay it. assuming you have an rv okay what's your destination all right so here's my issue i'm i don't have a driver's license <laughs> you don't oh because you grew up in new york city why would you yeah i don't um but I think if I did, I, I love California. Like I'm going in a couple of weeks um, okay. and I would have, I would love some time to do like a cross country trip to, to California and then up the PCH. Up the oh, that would be, highway. yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that would probably be, and somebody else would have to drive and I would, you know, I'll drive. Them, so. All yeah, right. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Um, what was the best thing you remember about growing up in the eighties? Um, the best thing about growing up in the eighties, you know, what was so wonderful is I think it was the first time that like kids became a marketing tool. So, so much was marketed towards us mm -hmm. toy wise and yes. the toys were fantastic. So like you were just rich in toys all the, like I played uh -huh. GI Joe's uh -huh. ad nauseum and yes. it became a precursor to my books. Like I would have them set up around my room and yep. these like. <laughs> you know, month long right. stories that would happen and then friends would come and they would, I would have to catch them up. Like this is happening and everything. So I think we were just so rich in like, you know, like really cool yeah. toys and, you know, you had to use your imagination for them. You know, we didn't have right. social media and stuff like that. Did not. Um, if you were to be part of the Gimmelmans, um, what mask would you choose? Oh, that's all, a good all the masks one. that they choose are musicians. So my favorite musician of all musicians is Bruce Springsteen. So okay. I, ha I have to go with the boss. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Fair. And I think he would be cool with that. I think he'd be very cool with that. He'd be very cool with that. Um, what was your favorite book as a teen? My favorite book as a teen. So in about eighth grade, I was just telling the story to somebody yesterday. Um, I read Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte yeah. and my mind was just blown. Like it's so twisted and Gothic yeah. and dark. And mm -hmm. I just started writing in high school, all these like very Gothic -y Wuthering Heights books. And there's a book in me that would be like a more, you know, not modern day Wuthering Heights, but like yeah. taking modern ideas and putting it into old Ooh. Wuthering Heights. Um, and I don't, with like a supernatural under that's all I have so far with that. Well, wow, um, sounds good. But yeah, Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte, definitely. Okay. And then the last question. What song would be on your mixtape from nineteen from the nineteen eighties? Oh, you know, I was just listening today and it's it's like when I'm doing like um like Instagram posts of the Gimmelmans. Mm -hmm. Um it was Take Me Home Tonight by Eddie Money. 
Yeah. Um, and I don't know, it just kind of like sums up the Gilmans. Like it's like happy and, you know, yes. like fast paced. Um, there's like a yeah. little bit of a dark undertone to it. Um, so yeah, I think it's a random song, but. Yeah, I mean, kids today don't even know what mixtapes are, right? No, no, that's that's unfortunately true. But yeah, Take Me Home Tonight by by Eddie Money was like a, I don't know, I was Good always listening to that when I was writing it. Yeah, so I've been so lucky, um, and we all have been so lucky this evening to be joined by Lee Matthew Goldberg, um, writer of The Great Gimmelmans, and many more. So I guarantee if this is your first introduction to Lee, you will go back and read his entire backlist. But great gift. Think holiday season stocking stuffers. So I want to say thank you for joining us. I want oh, to say thank you so much. This was an absolute pleasure, Jennifer. Yeah. Absolutely. And to our tech team, Mike, um, for making sure everything goes smoothly. And then thanks to all of you who are watching and listening. Um, this is Writers Unplugged. I'm Jen Jumba with the Cleveland Public Library. Thanks so much and happy reading.